Let's now immediately move on to the forum on capitalist globalization and border transition. And let's welcome Musa Changari. And before I introduce him, I'd also like to ask my co-facilitator to point out the technical specifics because we will now have a few more new viewers who have joined us. Julia. Yeah, we wollten noch mal darauf hinweisen auf die Übersetzungsfunktion. Also hallo von Backstage. Für euch I wanted to point out from Backstage that there is a translation function. There is a globe icon at the bottom of your screens. If you don't see this uh, icon, then uh, please use the uh, Zoom app. Now, the same thing is being repeated in Spanish. That is reminding us of the icon which is at the bottom of your screen. And if you if you uh, don't have don't see this button, then please use the Zoom app. And now. She's repeating the same thing in French, that in fact there is this translation function. Um, at the bottom of the screen, via the globe icon, if you don't see that icon, please use again the Zoom application. Und damit würden wir auch wieder zurück in den Backstage gehen. Viel Spaß. Dankeschön. Ja, vielen Dank nochmal. Thank you very much, Julia. And uh, regarding the process or the procedure here at the forum, it's 60 minutes or 55 now. We'll start with uh, Changari giving us a, an input, which Sandro can then react to. And then the two speakers can enter into a discussion again. And during that entire time, all of the participants that are registered via Zoom have the possibility to use the Q&A tool to ask questions which Julia Manek and Jasmin Behrens, my co-moderators, will collect and uh, cluster. And in the last third of the next hour, we will then address questions from the audience as clustered by Julia and posed to Sandra and Changari, and then the two can answer. So much for the procedure here. And with that, finally, over to Musa Changari, whom I'd like to introduce briefly. Changari is well known not just in Niger, but the entire Sahel region and beyond, a renowned journalist and human rights activist who gives us the Pan-African perspective on neo-colonial politics in the EU, and especially the so-called migration partnership between Europe and Niger and other states in the region. Musa Changari is the Secretary General of the Association Alternative Espace Citoyen in Niger, which of, with offices in various regions of the country for radio broadcasting stations and other publications are used um, by AIC to advocate the political rights of all groups, but especially also of migrants. And with that, the floor goes to Changari for his input. Right. Good morning or good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank you most cordially for inviting me to this conference. And the interpreter has to announce here that the participant is very hard to hear. It's very poor sound quality. We'll try and do our best. And now the sound is gone. Right, moving on. Two days ago, Musa Changari says, I received the invitation to take the floor at this conference and during this discussion panel on capitalist globalization and border transitions. I have thought back of a number of earlier events and also publications from the 80s and 90s, and now the sound is gone again, sorry.
Okay, trying again, says Musa Changare. I hope it'll work now. Okay, I was saying. that I was thinking back of some of my earlier publications. Now, the interpreters are awfully sorry. Sorry, this is such poor sound quality, it can't be interpreted. Sorry, constant disruptions. This cannot be interpreted. The per interpreters apologize. We'll resume translation as soon as the sound allows for it. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, The moderator, we are currently encountering some technical problems here. We're trying to resolve those in the background. We'll try again. We know, of course, that globalization... Is it working now? says Musa Changari. Okay, good to hear that. Is it working? The moderator again. Maybe the technical Specialist in the background can ask Musa Changari to switch off his camera so that we can at least hear the sound halfway decently. Okay, bon, j'ai j'ai la caméra. So I've disactivated the camera. Does it work now? Apparently, my internet connection is not stable. Does it work? Does it work? Yes, we can hear you. So sorry about the glass. Here's the translation again. There were there was coverage in the media time and again to describe social phenomenon which initially made us hopeful because globalization was already something which at least in Africa was already going on. All of the borders had been torn down and many options were available. On the political side, that was a promise holding boundless opportunities of improving one's life and circumstances. So, politically speaking, this was a grand promise of larger capitalization, of more production of wealth to be available to everyone. 
So it's been promised that nobody would be left behind and that more parts of the population would indeed be able to partake in progress. Already back then, it could be felt what would be the result of that. But we've been assured time and again that the ongoing process and sorry, the sound has just been disrupted entirely again. OK, moving on. With the extraordinary development of information and communication technology, which could already be felt back at the time, we were told that this process in the IT world would contribute to the borders disappearing in the sense that borders would no longer be major obstacles for the exchange of goods and services and even for the mobility of people. We were told that democracy, which was almost inseparably linked to market economy, would be spreading across Europe first building on the ruins of the former Eastern Bloc states and then moving into Africa. Unfortunately, it took only a few years until everybody was aware of what was really behind this concept of globalization, which is capitalist market economy spreading at an international level and continuing to be dominated by the large multinational corporations. Production output increased thanks to technological and IT revolutions, but the people working there didn't feel any of the effects of increasing wealth and growth. Democratic control of globalization was no longer possible. Neither the World Bank nor the International Monetary Fund nor the World Trade Organization were able to contain this because international trade certainly increased in volume. However, the poorer countries didn't profit from it. And sorry again, the sound is gone. In all countries of the South, borders were overcome, but this did not lead to a situation where products from the markets of the northern half of the world uh, would have arrived in our countries. Everywhere regional or local structures were destroyed through the import of liberal market economy principles. And nothing was put in place of those previous grown structures. Neither the European Union nor the free trade zone in the Americas did anything to prevent this. The pan-national organizations under the excuse of wanting to promote democracy have only contributed to destruction. In other words, globalization meant that we've become a lot more dependent on the international finance flows of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. And that is true for all countries in the Global South and the effects on working conditions of in terms of competitiveness of the economy and when it comes to balancing out the inequalities of the national economies were completely out of control. Back then, one mostly wanted to attract investments from the rich countries. 
So the promise wasn't kept that went along with globalization. These structural changes led to an un unparalleled impoverishment of the population. And in always, almost all countries, these led to violent conflicts. In Europe, where the welfare state was withdrawing more and more, liberal practices also led to an increase of unemployment, of xenophobia, and of racial hatred. And today, we all see this dream of the global village as something which we can only look back on with regret, this dream that we were made to believe in in the 90s. The world today is not a place in which you can live together in a good way, in a world in which everybody has access to the products and services generated. The world today is pretty much like a village divided into different quarters or neighborhoods, separated by walls. You can no longer go into the neighboring quarter. People, especially those with no specific and particular skills and with no money, are left behind. And these people are considered as a threat to the social order and to the economic and political union, and are called that too. That, unfortunately, is the picture that globalization is presenting today. Although years ago it was promised to be the cure for everything. Now, many years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, Europe is in the process of becoming a fortress, a fortress not just versus the countries of other continents, that is, where the walls have always become more and more impenetrable over the years. No, right now, Europe is even reintroducing new border controls between the Schengen countries. So the promise of an open and free Europe with free movement has given way to the reality of the fortress of Europe, at the door of which those fleeing from the rest of the world are standing and failing to enter. At the borders of those countries that have been able to com pile up the most riches, the European Union has managed in its policy to combat migration to take some countries such as Niger, for example, and established centers within Niger from which migrants are to be redistributed. That is considered to be an efficient means of preventing people from the global south to opt for migration. Niger and neighboring countries everywhere in the world, there are considerable resources and also considerable funds are invested in order to promote development. I'll try to wrap it up here.
if the doors remain closed to migration, as was the case in the early 90s with the structural plans, that will mean that young people in Africa and other countries of the world will live up to what a famous researcher once called a mass of human beings exposed to need and poverty and disease. And these young people will become radicalized, as we're currently seeing it in the Sahel region, for example. And that is something we need to turn everybody's attention to, not that the attention of the Europeans. But the Europeans do have a special responsibility in this instance. No sound, apologies. Sound is back. If there is something we all need to state, given the massive changes over the last years, it's the following. Politics and walls will not be able to protect Europe. And sound is gone again. going on. The Euro European politics combating migration, in my belief, is a mistaken political approach. And responsible for this are the international organizations and countries. But it's a policy that can only fail because the European countries have massive problems themselves, especially mass unemployment, which has nothing to do with the streams of migrants and equally the rights and principles and values that Europe has always aimed at protecting. They are not at all endangered by migration. The European anti-migration policy only goes to show that uh, people shy away from courageous reforms in order to make for a more humane globalization. The news, the current situation is currently very much uh, dominated by fighting the COVID pandemic, but this uh, cannot gloss over and deny the fact that the European policy hostile to migration is going to continue. That's the one point Europe can agree on. Migration is considered as a threat, as a danger. And this illustrates that even with strictly patrolled and controlled borders, Thousands of people still cannot be de kept outside and prevented from fleeing. We are told there is movement of goods, but no financial flows, because this may lead to severe crises in Europe as well, which would in turn have disastrous effects on us too. And I would like to close with that and uh, 
very much hope that my input, despite of the unfortunately poor connection, was sufficient for us to now conduct a discussion on it. So once again, apologies for the poor connection, and I hope that uh, quite a bit of it got across and we can now proceed with the discussion. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Musa Changari. Right, I think actually we heard enough to have a discussion. Thank you for this very interesting presentation. Now, before we give Sandra the opportunity to re Spond. I would also like to touch on the point that uh, with both contributions, we saw that against the backdrop of the pandemic. Sorry, I'm experiencing an echo here, says the speaker. Now, does it work now? No. Right, why don't I pass the floor to Sandro and I'll try to fix this in the meantime. Sandro, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mutsa. I think uh, uh, you made uh, uh, a couple of uh, uh, very good points. Uh, uh, and uh, despite uh, the technical problems, uh, uh, we all uh, <laughs> got them. <laughs> I will be very quick uh, so to uh, leave time for the, the discussion. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Musa was uh, uh, giving us uh, uh, a picture of uh, globalization uh, from Africa that uh, uh, we can, uh, in a way, generalize uh, without losing sight uh, of uh, the peculiarity of uh, Africa. What was uh, uh, very effective uh, in uh, his uh, speech uh, was the image uh, of a village uh, with uh, quarters and neighborhoods uh, divided and at the same time connected uh, by walls. Speaking of a village uh, implies a speaking uh, of uh, a shared condition. But the way in which uh, this uh, shared condition is experienced uh, is radically different, is uh, uh, hierarchized and uh, uh, reproduced in this hierarchical form by uh, a panoply of uh, walls. It is uh, easy to say, but I think it is also necessary to say that uh, smashing those walls becomes uh, a crucial uh, political uh, task. And this is true uh, for uh, uh, the walls that uh, uh, crisscross and divide uh, uh, homogeneous uh, uh, national or urban spaces, no less than for uh, uh, fortified uh, borders uh, that uh, uh, aim uh, uh, to contain and stop uh, movements uh, of migration. I think that uh, uh, in uh, the uh, picture provided by Musa, uh, movements of migration uh, have uh, a real important role to play uh, to make uh, uh, globalization uh, more uh, humane, as uh, he was uh, saying. In a way, uh, we can pick up again on uh, the idea 
that uh, uh, played uh, quite an important role uh, in uh, um, anti-racist uh, uh, movements in Europe uh, in the last two decades, uh, that uh, uh, movements uh, of migration uh, uh, instantiate and embody, at least potentially, a different form of globalization, a globalization from uh, below. But needless uh, to say, uh, what we have uh, to imagine is a politics uh, capable to uh, make uh, such globalization from below uh, effective. <laughs> and uh, uh, in Europe, uh, this is uh, a particularly important task for the reason described uh, by Musa with respect uh, to uh, border politics uh, and uh, uh, migratory uh, politics. So we stop here for now so that we have bit of time to discuss. <laughs> yeah, vielen Dank, Sandro. Thank you, Sandro, for this comment. Uh, my audio seems to be working fine again, says the speaker. Um, let me also say a few words. Uh, during Sandro's uh, input, we it also sounded that as if the corona pandemic um, is also reflected in the media and that that also can contribute to an acceleration of the, of the dystopia. I'd like to ask uh, Musa Changari how that is impacting his work on the site and what the struggle will focus on in the next years. I heard that uh, he was uh, as part of uh, the pre under the pretext of the corona pandemic. Um, he also had an experience. So Musa Changari, against the backdrop of this radical transition with the pandemic, what does that mean for the struggle on site? Well, what it means is that we are experiencing restrictions in our freedom imposed by the government. The situation is being exploited in order to uh, restrict our freedom and to arrest us um, at times. That has happened when we had ignored um, orders by the government that were issued as part of the COVID pandemic. Public space as such is being restricted and the possibilities posed by public space and possible in public space. The impending elections are also used as an argument and of course the pandemic. There are risks for us as you are out and about, after all, mobility has also been restricted. And that also means that a great number of migrants who had difficulties in the past and uh, were being blocked, uh, experiencing that, are experiencing that to an even greater degree. And European politics are outsourced to Niger. And uh, the pandemic is a wonderful pretext that allows you to impose even greater restrictions and also border crossings. That's unfortunately the case. Thank you very much. At this point, looking at the time, I would like to ask our co-moderators whether there are questions, because it does seem that there are questions that were posed by the audience. If So if we have some of those questions, we could in integrate those in our discussion. Yes, exactly. As earlier, the chat and the Q&A uh, section are used intensively. They're pretty much exploded, and one question is mainly directed at Musa Changari, but also at Sandro. And the question is whether the idealization of the migration movement is something that they also 
see that's something that uh, the European left is, has been fostering. And then another major question that I'd like to um, also add is that looking at uh, the multiple crises of which the pandemic is only one, there has been suge the suggestion that this might also offer an opportunity to form new coalitions. And the question from the audience is what possibilities are there of creating coalitions and also of having an impact on the formation of algorithms as so civil society? And also what, what will happen to those who have become superfluous as part of global capitalism and who will have even less access because they do not have access to the digital world? Okay, Changari, would you like to take that question first, or those questions? Yes, sure. I believe. I believe that in Africa and Asia we are defending a right, and that is the right of all to mobility. That's something that not only exists in Europe, that's a right that we have and that we need to defend. Everybody has the right to go wherever he or she wants, to live in the country and to work in the country and in a dignified life where they want to. That's um, a general principle that needs to be upheld and defended. Now, of course, it would be desirable that the reasons that cause people to get on the move in the first place are addressed so that the people can stay where they really want to stay and that they can live in their countries of origin a life in dignity. But currently, these conditions um, are not there. They've been destroyed as part of uh, years spent with structural um, change programs that made it difficult for people to stay at home, to stay in the country of origin. They have to leave. They are forced to for economic reasons, for reasons that are related to climate change, or because there are conflicts in a number of countries and structures which destroy all of society and make a life in dignity impossible. They have no choice but to get up and leave. What we are striving for and fighting for is to say everybody can live in peace, a life in dignity, and can choose the conditions in which they want to live their life. It must be possible to create those conditions. And that must be possible if you decide to discontinue certain political approaches and to choose different ones. It's revolution that this is about. And I was listening to what Sandro was saying uh, in English directly, and he's calling for a revolution, and that is what is needed. The world does have the resources to enable a life in dignity for everyone. The resources are there. However, it is a minority that is keeping them to themselves, a minority that is keeping so much of the resources and the wealth. 90% of global resources uh, and 1% of global population, roughly. That's uh, the ratio. And that is our struggle uh, for free mobility, freedom of movement for everyone globally. And that's not an idealization of migration, no. Rather, it is a logic that is based on enforcing a right, a right and a claim that is enshrined in many constitutions, but that's being prevented by politics. Now, as far as coalitions go, I believe it is important for us to fight this globally, for movements to network and to get together as part of a global struggle, 
on site, of course, locally, but also as part of a global network. A number of years ago, as part of the World Social Forum, this was much discussed. But uh, act local, think global, that's sort of uh, no longer as topical, it seems. But we need to get back to that, to base ourselves on local movements, but act as part of networks and space for resistance, sp space for thinking, thinking about alternatives to existing systems can then be formed and work can be done that can lead to the creation of things that apply to all and to everyone and that allow them to take over their part of the power in the world. And there are such movements out there already. They're forming, and they very specifically look at this question of taking on power and of building something completely, completely new. And, and well, that's that's a question that many organizations globally are faced with. Okay. Thank you very much. Sandra, would you like to react again? So on the question uh, of uh, the idealization of uh, migration, uh, I fully agree with uh, Musa. Uh, I would add that uh, uh, there is a need uh, uh, to uh, specify uh, the meaning of uh, European left uh, when uh, asking such uh, a question. Because uh, if uh, European left uh, uh, includes also the kind of uh, institutional center left uh, that we have uh, many European countries, uh, well, uh, uh, the real problem is that uh, a large part of that left uh, shares uh, the idea that migration is a threat. <laughs> there is not at all uh, a tendency to idealize uh, migration. And for me, this is uh, a big problem. I mean, if I look uh, at uh, uh, Italian politics uh, in the la in the last uh, 25 years, uh, there was a kind of convergence uh, between uh, a large part of the quote and unquote left uh, and uh, of the right uh, uh, on the definition of migration uh, mainly as uh, a threat. <laughs> But I guess the question refers to uh, minoritarian social movements that uh, struggle with the migrants. In this respect, uh, as far as I am concerned, at least uh, 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 I wouldn't say that uh, I ever tended to idealize migration. I rather emphasized uh, that uh, uh, migration uh, uh, raises uh, crucial challenges for the left. <laughs> and then the left must uh, creatively uh, react to those uh, challenges. <laughs> On the question of uh, coalitions, indeed, I think uh, that uh, uh, the question of coalition uh, uh, is a very important question uh, today. Mm. Uh, you were saying that uh, we are confronted uh, with uh, several crises and that uh, the pandemic uh, is just one among them, which is of course true. But I would add that uh, uh, the pandemic acted as a kind of catalyst uh, of uh, different uh, crises. Mm. And the way in which uh, we have to react to uh, those crises uh, is uh, uh, precisely uh, linked with the building of uh, coalitions. 
uh, let me give uh, uh, a very quick uh, example. Uh, in Italy, uh, there are currently uh, quite uh, uh, important uh, uh, struggles uh, on public health and public education, secondary, primary and secondary schools. <laughs> If you look at those struggles, <laughs> they all uh, instantiate and embody a coalitional principle. <laughs> Because you find the feminist movement <laughs> in struggles uh, around uh, education and health. You find uh, the anti-racist uh, movement. You find, of course, uh, uh, teachers on the one end and doctors and nurses on the other end, and so on. So each of uh, 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 these uh, seemingly uh, specific uh, uh, struggles uh, uh, embody a principle of coalition. Needless to say, that is the problem of building a coalition between uh, uh, struggles on public health and struggles on public education. And I could go on. But I do think that uh, uh, the principle of coalition should be at the center of uh, our uh, reflections, even theoretically, and of our practices. Ja, vielen Dank. Thank you very much. I suggest we now take one more round of questions from the Q&A session, and I'd give the floor to Julia again to give us the next cluster of questions. Yes, okay. We'd like to suggest two questions on the subjectification. Arun says, how about hatred? coming up in the Global South pertaining to the global injustices and now to do with further restrictions of mobility and further restrictions going along with the pandemic. Why is there so little reported about this hatred and about these uproars? So why is this type of subjectification of being a subject not something that's being reported on? It's only just ever the suffering being portrayed. And a second question also to with subjectification, which is how can it be that this narrative that capitalism apparently has to be linked to democracy is so persistent? That would be a question for both speakers. Who would like to start? I don't know. Okay, then let me start, says Musa Changari. I didn't quite catch the first question. I couldn't hear it, but I'll answer the second one. Regarding the relationship between democracy and capitalism, yes, there is this narrative which claims this connection. However, History has also taught us different things, that democracy and capitalism are connected, that liberal democracy always goes hand in glove with capitalism. That seems to be a fact, historically speaking, at least in many countries, in the European countries, in America. Political liberalism, democracy, liberal democracy, civilian-based democracy depends on capitalism or is connected to capitalism. That is a standard experience. But one can also see that capitalism also works under completely authoritarian authoritarian structures. That's another thing we can see from history and can still see at our present day and age. 
in many regions where those two still fit in together. But democracy and capitalism are largely connected. And if things don't work out in the economy and in capitalism, then very often a consequence of that is to impose restrictions on liberty. Capitalism obviously doesn't automatically lead to democracy. Quite reversely, it can also be a threat to democracy, and I've tried to elaborate on that in my talk when I said that in recent years, democracy, even in countries where it had already been far progressed, was robbed of its content, so to speak, by some elite who have uh, made use of that democracy serving their very own purposes. Now, democracy is to serve the good of the citizens, of the people. But we've seen and experienced that there are some who've uh, conquered the democracy, so to speak, and uh, used it to their ends. OK, thank you. Maybe we'll hold it a minute before I give Sandra a chance to reply and add another question and then ask him to answer them while at the same time coming to the end and wrapping up. And that's the question, returning to why is there so little communication about hatred in the Global South, this injustice that has been so exacerbated by immobilization because of the COVID policy. Why is there so little coverage of that? Why is so little being talked about it, the subjectification of those in the Global South? Why isn't that actually covered? They always have a certain role to play also in the discourse on the left side, in the social discourse. And Sandro, maybe you can address that as the other part of the question. And then, wrapping up, I would give the floor to Musa Changari again. But first, you again, Sandro, on this question. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, Zabine bon, bon, for the... Uh, uh, merci. Uh, en fait, en d'avoir participé à, ce, à cet échange-là. Malheureusement, vraiment, la connexion n'a pas été au rendez-vous. Ça montre la première fois qu'ils ne sont pas tous logés à la même enseigne. Hein? Euh, nous, nous sommes un peu moins euh, <rire> que vous. <rire> so sorry about some confusion with the channels here. Musa, you'll be given the floor again towards the end. Now we'll ask Sandro to give his reply and we'll give you the floor again at the end. Oh, it's not yet time to say goodbye, says Musa Changari. Okay. No, it's not yet over, says the moderator. First Sandro and then you with your final contribution. And then that's the end. We're still going on. We'll be running a bit limit a few minutes over. That's fine. Sandro. I would like First of all, to thank uh, uh, Zabine for her clarification uh, regarding the question uh, on uh, uh, the, uh, the idealization of uh, uh, migration. I get uh, uh, your point. Uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, I don't really see uh, idealization uh, as uh, a widespread tendency in uh, anti-racist uh, uh, movements uh, in Europe. Uh, of course, uh, 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 if you speak with activists, uh, uh, they have uh, idealistic uh, motivations. <laughs> And they need such motivations uh, to engage every day in uh, the struggle against uh, uh, racism, in uh, supporting uh, processes of migrant uh, self-organization. Uh, I uh, do think that uh, um, we need to... Um, go on uh, with uh, uh, the political
political discussion on uh, migration, mm. even within uh, social movements. Uh, my sense uh, is that uh, uh, there is a need uh, uh, to discuss uh, migration in Europe today uh, in a kind of new conjuncture. Mm. Many times I have a sense that we speak uh, of migration with the tools, with the language that we used uh, until uh, 2016. Mm until uh, the long summer of uh, migration. So there is definitely a need uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, reorganize our uh, political discussion on migration, but I do not see uh, uh, a tendency to idealization uh, as uh, uh, a real problem uh, uh, today. Mm. Regarding the question of uh, hate uh, in uh, the Global South, well, uh, you'd like to say, first of all, uh, that uh, uh, such uh, uh, form of uh, subjectivation is not limited uh, to the Global South. You can find uh, uh, really many instances of that uh, in uh, the peripheries of uh, European, uh, European cities among uh, young people who uh, do not see any chance for uh, their future. Then each uh, form of it has uh, its own uh, characteristic. And uh, 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 I would like to say that uh, um, sometimes uh, we tend to speak of uh, the global south uh, uh, as a kind uh, of a huge uh, homogeneous uh, kind of space. Uh, while, of course, there are many differences uh, in uh, the Global South, and uh, uh, you can find uh, different instances uh, of the politics of hate uh, in uh, different parts of the Global South, uh, as well as of uh, the Global North. Uh, you know, the question of the relation between capitalism and democracy uh, is a vexed question, and Musa already uh, said some uh, uh, important things uh, uh, about it. But first question, I will be uh, very quick. First question, what is democracy? How do we define democracy? Uh, is democracy simply um, defined by uh, regular uh, elections? <laughs> Well, regular elections uh, can uh, also uh, be uh, important moments for the politics that aim at reconstructing the world in specific uh, uh, conditions. But we were uh, accustomed to uh, link to democracy also something else, kind of uh, uh, social dimension, uh, a specific form uh, of citizenship, uh, social rights. And uh, uh, I think it is safe to say that uh, uh, such dimension undergoes uh, uh, quite a deep crisis uh, uh, nowadays. Hmm? Mm. Another question. Uh, we can think of democracy simply in terms of a political system. Mm. But you can also think uh, democracy uh, taking as a point of departure a kind of split between uh, a democratic political system and a democratic movement. Mm. I think that today, uh, uh, this notion of a democratic movement uh, is particularly important, and not only in uh, uh, the global uh, uh, north. Last uh, uh, quick remark, uh, uh, speaking of democracy today um, also implies uh, to confront uh, uh, a global order and disorder, in which uh, uh, there are uh, uh, important uh, emerging powers uh, who do not uh, define themselves uh, as democratic. Take China, of course. Mm -hmm. 
from this point of view, we have to rethink a bit uh, the, the question of democracy and also the relation uh, between democracy and uh, uh, capitalism. <laughs> Thank you, and let's pass the floor to Musa Changari. Sorry that I interrupted you earlier, but we wanted you to speak last and to be able to respond to the question and to share what you wanted uh, to say at the end. Well, this question of the idealization of migration is something I would like to go back to. Earlier, I already shared that I do not believe that such an idealization is taking place, but it is possible to say one thing in regard of this. Political action that is being taken these days is emblematic of something. It clearly stands for something. On the one hand, it shows that the global north is refusing to take the politics that have been imposed on other countries, especially on countries of the global south, and it is refusing to apply that to itself. Uh, the countries of the North have created a disaster in the global South, and the North is not willing to take responsibility for that. And uh, the people living in the global South are not allowed to migrate to the global North in order to live in better conditions there. And then the third remark is that uh, due to the action that has been taken, sorry, interpreter is not getting sound, a distinction is supposed to be made between people when really people could be making a change together. That's terrible, but with all the action that is being taken, all you can gather is that an attempt is made to not have to bear responsibility. When I speak with friends from the global north, time and again I find them saying, well, yes, migration is a problem and so on and so forth. But then if and when you say that migration is a problem, you are st staying in the same position as those that you are trying to criticize the right forces. If you, you view migration as something that is a problem, then something has gone wrong. And that is a conclusion that you ought not to be drawing in the first place, because then the solution can only be, it must be prevented uh, that these people come. The people must be prevented from coming. And the simple solutions are available and uh, can be accepted, but the fact that people are fleeing and on the run per se is not a problem. People must have the right to move where they want, to live where they want to live. These are human-made problems that we need to solve, that we urgently need to solve so that the whole world can do better. I believe that our friends in the global north indeed should call their approach into question and 
I do not want to go into to the details of this, but I believe this is the essential message that I would like to share. I'll leave it at that, and I'd once again like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to take part in this. Thank you, Musa Changari. We would like to thank you, and uh, we'd also like to thank Sandro Mezzara for this interesting, interesting forum um, that has also resulted in a call to revolution. Uh, there will be a break now, a one-hour break, and I'd like to once again thank everyone who's participating and who's asked questions. Thank you.